Louis Lepke Buckhalter was born in New York City on February 6, 1897, the son of Barnett Buckhalter, who had come to America from Russia and operated a hardware shop on the Lower East Side of New York City. His mother was refined and well-educated, and one sister was a schoolteacher. His brothers included a dentist and a rabbi. In his youth, Buckalter attended the public schools and assisted his father in the operation of the hardware store until his father's death in 1909. Later, the family moved to Brooklyn. After completing grade school in 1910s, Buckhalter obtained employment as a salesman for a concern engaged in distributing theatrical goods. Buckhalter was first arrested on September 2, 1915, on a charge of burglary. Released by the grand jury, he was next arrested in January 1916 on a similar charge, but he was again released. His first real brush with law enforcement came the following month, when he was arrested at Bridgeport, Connecticut, charged with the theft of a grip from an automobile following his conviction. He was sentenced to the Connecticut Reformatory at Cheshire, Connecticut, where he was received in May 1916 for the next dozen years. Buckhalter won in and out of prison on numerous occasions, being arrested on charges including burglary, armed robbery, grand larceny, and consorting with criminals during this time. He became closely associated with Jacob Shapiro, and the notorious careers of the two were closely allied thereafter. During the early 1930s, Buckhalter and Shapiro turned to the lucrative rackets which were plaguing the entire New York area. In the years that followed, they built a criminal empire said matched in the annale of racketeering. The activities of their mob became the subject of headline after headline in the Metropolitan Dailies. With the typical weapons of their ilk, they attacked the poultry, fur, artichoke, and clothing industries. Brutality, violence, intimidation, and vandalism were their stock in trade as they moved in on flourishing businesses. Lead pipes, stench bombs, bullets, and strong-armed bandits were the tools they used. It was soon obvious that it was far less painful to give the outlaws their cut than to defy them. One New York man, sitting quietly at home, was approached by a stranger carrying a folded newspaper. Not a word was spoken as the intruder took from the new paper a bottle of acid which he dashed into the face of the innocent victim, leaving him seriously burned and scarred for life. The owner of a business in New Jersey learned the ways of the racketeers when his plant was bombed. Buckalter's hirelings, armed with iron pipes wrapped in newspapers and with guns, staged a daring attack on the headquarters of a union while a meeting was in progress another enemy of the rackets was found in a ditch in Detroit. Tied securely in a jackknife. Position. Once established as a kingpin of this vicious empire, Louis Buckhalter found it convenient and undoubtedly much safer to retire behind the scenes. He became one of the wealthiest of men, living in luxury and directing Biz reign of terror from afar. Although arrested on many occasions, he seemed to be immune to punishment. Finally, however, towards the end of 1936, authorities started to close in. In November of that year, he was convicted with Shapiro for violation of the federal antitrust laws. The following August, Backalter and Shapiro were indicted with 14 others by a grand jury of New Work City for conspiracy to extort money from clothing factory with a long list of other charges about to be. Leveled against him, Buckalter decided to go into hiding. He dropped out of sight, but while continuing the tremendous investigations necessary to bring Bim to justice, authorities directed their attention to his henchmen. Federal and local grand juries began studying in detail the methods and record of the racketeers. Buckhalter's underworld associates were being forced to appear in court. Big shot mobsters in various parts of the United States were summoned to appear before grand juries. In short, the heat was on. The hoodlums facing the grand juries realized that the whole empire was crumbling, with Buckhalter apparently about to squirm out from under it. 
New York authorities, however, had not forgotten him. They issued a $25,000 reward for him, dead or alive. The investigation of the FBI to locate Buckalter was intensified, and the pressure from the underworld for Backalter's appearance mounted. Finally, in August 1939, Buckalter found that he cooed no longer hide, and he was forced to give himself up to the FBI. On December 20s, 1939, Louis Buckalter was convicted upon the first of ten indictment in U.S. District Court in New York City. Two weeks later, he entered pleas of guilty to the nine remaining federal indictments. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison and placed on probation for 10 additional years. Other charges, including some for conspiracy, harboring, narcotics, and antitrust violations, still remain to be deposed of. In March 1940s, he was found guilty on 50 counts of an indictment by the General Sessions Court in New York City for which he was sentenced to a term of from 30 years to life to be served upon completion of his federal sentence. He commenced the latter term at Leavenworth Prison in April 1940s, but the law had not finished with Louis Buckhalter. He was later found guilty of murder in Kings County, New York, and on March 4, 1944, he died in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison.